Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to give a few uh, a mix of presentations about the infrastructure here at uh, EMF Camp. Uh, my name's Will Hargrave, and I've been um, kind of looking after some of the teams all together who are, who are delivering this stuff. Um, I'll just introduce my, I'm, I'm going to say colleagues, but it doesn't seem like the right word. Um, <laughs> this is uh, Ayan, who's been mostly dealing with the uh, Wi-Fi. Um, I have David C, who's been heading up the NOC team. Uh, Equi has been uh, working on a lot of the core network and other interesting things. And uh, Peter, who has come from Germany to uh, do the VOC video casting. So thanks very much. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about the, the power situation myself. Um, so uh, we actually have a bunch of scripts in uh, which are on GitHub. Uh, of course, you can't see any of this stuff, but can you see it perfectly? We should have put it up here earlier when we were building it. It's pretty nice to see. I mean, um, yeah, we actually have a bunch of Python scripts that um, I smashed together in uh, 2014 because I got really frustrated with Excel spreadsheets for planning power um, and using Network X and some cool stuff like that and spitting out a diagram to make sure that we don't order the wrong connectors. Um, they were all on GitHub, by the way. You can you can have a look and look at my terrible coding. Um, and uh, yeah, so this time uh, we have uh, two power grids um, with a um, actually for the critical stuff. Uh, BS seven nine oh nine code of practice for temporary electrical installations uh, requires us to have two sources of input for site lighting. So we actually have a mains failure panel somewhere out here. So if one grid goes down, the essential services are protected, which we didn't do before. Um, so yeah, we have two two hundred kVA generators. One droning away down there and one droning away up there. I'm sure you've heard them. Um, otherwise, it's actually remarkably similar to, to 20, 2014, uh, those of you that are there. Um, we have a lot of distros out around the field. We've got 13 amp sockets in, in Donald Close. We've got 16 amps on the field for you to plug into. Uh, we didn't really have enough stuff this time. Uh, our rental company were, yeah, a load of stuff didn't come back from hire. So we've had some challenges there and I know a few of you have um, had to wait a little while to get connected and we're pretty sorry about that. Um, but well, yeah, we just need more next time, more and more stuff. So basically on this diagram, everything is, is, uh, that's in red is a three phase connection. Uh, so we've you know, basically got a tree spanning up from the generator down, um, with, uh, one, two, five and 63 amp three phase cables that you've probably tripped over. Um, <laughs> they're the big rubber ones. And then, and down, down and down to the edge. Um, here's the, uh, here's the second diagram. This is the, uh, that's the north grid, yeah, so that's, that's the one to north. This is all the way, by the way, on GitHub, you can have a look, should you desire. Um, we did some awesome graphing this time. Um, uh, Russ has made some uh, generator monitoring tools, which uh, um, plug into the generator's RS485 pores and are powered from the generator's DC bus. Um, so we were able to collect, actually properly from the generator, all the stuff it displays in its front panel, you know, all those super nerdy things like, what's the engine coolant temperature of my generator? Or how much fuel is left? What's the burn per hour? What's the, you know, some of this is actually useful and I don't really care that much how warm or cool it is, as long as it's not boiling. It's about 82 degrees C, by the way, mostly. Anyway, here's a total power. Um, one is the north one. Um, and, and two is the south. Um, We just, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> quickly, this is a stack graph, basically, so you can see the total usage, which it kind of peaks around 100 kilowatts, which is roughly about right for a couple of 200 kVA generators. I mean, I wouldn't want to run out. I wouldn't want to run out of power. Um, <laughs> sorry? Heaven forbid we should run out of power. Well, we'd have had a few power outages. The, the catering always uses a lot, and um, because we've actually managed to get a lot more food vendors and stuff like that this time. Uh, they've been using a lot more electricity, so um, we'll have to beef that area up a little bit in future because 163 amp three phase is not really enough. Um, but yeah, all this, all of this stuff, um, a lot of the generator stats and stuff are available on uh, dashboard.emf.camp. Um, you can click around in there and look at the generators and, and see what we're up to. Um, other than that, uh, that's about it from the power point of view. Um, we, in, in kind of practical stuff, um, we are going around and trying to unplug cables when you need them. Um, we are planning to power off the 
north side of the site uh, tomorrow morning or earlier if we run out of fuel. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So you, most people need to be off site by midday. So uh, if you're not helping, uh, so yeah, uh, we'll be saying goodbye to the power up there and rolling all that out tomorrow morning. Um, and we're running around as quickly as we can to unplug your cables and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, when you need it. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, I'll pass over to who wants to talk about the uplink, David. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about how we get the internet to the field and then I'll pass on to Equi to talk about how it comes around the field and to AK about the wireless. And uh, one of the first questions is, uh, we get is, how do you actually get a really fast internet connection to a field, potentially in the middle of the nowhere and certainly not near any useful internet points of presence? Well, in 2012, um, this is what we did. We did a microwave point-to-point -point link to a local data center. Uh, it wasn't fun. Even if you pay someone else to do it for you, there's an awful lot of faff to get it set up and get it aligned and get it working and getting, and getting the speed that you want. So we said in 2012, we're never doing microwave again. And then in 2013, we did this. 13. Oh, yeah. Electromagnetic. <clears throat> and then in 2014, we did this. Um, and then in 2016, well, mission accomplished. We, fin <laughs> we finally have a, a fiber connection all the way down to the site from a provider. Um, so uh, as you are probably aware, Lowesley House is just up a few hundred meters up from our field, um, and they renovated their business park a few years ago, and they had the immense foresight to not only dig a very large trench all the way towards Guildford, uh, several miles across their land so they could have better access to fiber. But they also have a fiber network running around the business park as well. Um, and uh, that, that network is managed by a company called Fiber Options who've been incredibly helpful to us. Um, and uh, we simply had to run a fiber of our own up to their nearest outside splice point um, and plug into their network. Um, mostly along uh, hedges and fences at one point, uh, along some steel wire up at a couple of trees just to allow vehicular access if needed. And terminating Tuesday evening, I believe this was uh, late, uh, in some late night splicing in the dark just to test everything was working. Um, so a passive optical network, as many of you will know, is generally designed to uh, get a lot of fiber to a lot of places, whether that's along a, a large area or to a lot of businesses. Um, and it does that by um, having passive optical splitters along the network that are relatively cheap, and it just basically forks the signal off and then recombines it on the way back up. Um, and that's the technology they use up on the business park, uh, but, unfo but fortunately, um, uh, I'll, I'll get, get to that in a moment. So this is what this is what we were given um, as the uh, the ONT, uh, the optical ne network termination device. It's uh, it weighs uh, a few grams. Uh, it, it contains a router, a four port switch, a couple of VoIP ports, and a Wi-Fi access point. Um, <laughs> made of plastic. <laughs> it, it is made of plastic. Um, the only difference from your typical so Soho router is that it's got a, a fiber input there. Um, and I'm sure it's fine for most of their customers, uh, a small business or, or a home user who only needs to do a small amount of traffic. Um, and I'm sure it's fine when it works in routed mode where it can use hardware acceleration to actually shov shovel packets around. Unfortunately, what we wanted is a bridge connection. And what we, what we wanted was a VLAN that is presented here to us and presented to our router up in London Docklands and uh, has nothing on a logical level, has nothing else in the way. So this device was put into bridge mode, um, and it turns out uh, that it does bridging in software on a 600 megahertz CPU. So, <laughs> so before we even send any traffic down it, simply announcing our routes, which is the best part of a slash, slash 16, so 40, 50,000 um, IP addresses, simply the background noise of the internet, uh, the port scans and things like that, uh, was enough to completely knock this device out. Uh, I don't think they're used, to, they're used to dealing with such large address space going through, their, through these devices. Um, but we talked to Fiber Options, um, who, as I say, have been incredibly helpful. Um, we proposed a solution because um, it turns out that although they use passive optical network technology on the, on the business park, there's not actually any splitters in the ground. The only splitter is 
uh, the lower rack unit you see there, it's uh, simply a way to get many ports into a single interface on their optical head end, um, which uh, we noticed also had some SFP ports. Um, and given that this is the only splitter, there was a clear fiber path, a single mode core going all the way from this site all the way up to their comms room up on the estate. Um, and they very kindly allowed us to plug one of our SFPs into their, into their unit there running gigabit ethernet again on a single core because it's a bi-directional optic so it transmits and receives in in different frequencies in different directions um, and yes fortunately we also had flex optics uh, who uh, another one of our amazing sponsors had sent us a large number of optics and we were simply able to recode them to work in this device so at which point a gigabit down to the field so how did you use this gigabit well Disappointingly, <laughs> um, I think we averaged over the weekend probably about 100 megabits in, not so much up. Uh, we have this dashboard, uh, which you should feel free to look at, ideally before you leave camp, because I don't know how long we can keep it running after camp, but do have a look at that. Um, it's got more stuff underneath, um, all the useful stuff uh, that we use to monitor the network and that is interesting. Um, so the total amount of traffic, our peak was 505 megabits. So we used at our peak, used about half of our capability. Um, and the total amount of traffic, I'm afraid to say, is I have, I have hard disks bigger than that. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll pass over to Equinox to talk about how we get the network around the field from our data center here. Hi. So uh, I'm Equinox. Um, I'm going to tell you a few bits about how we actually uh, deliver the internet around the campsite. Um, so what you can see here is uh, the physical overview of uh, the data loops which you've seen around. Um, so the core network is built on, built on fiber, which is patched to maybe half of the data loops. Um, what we do here is we just go into the data loo and patch the fibers through to the next data loo so we don't lose them when they are behind something that goes down. Um, and then the stuff that is further out is connected by copper. Um, you can see those on the black lines uh, in the diagram. Um, so we try to minimize uh, the stuff that we do with copper, uh, but it's, it's not really viable to do everything with fiber. Um, but yeah, so the good thing uh, about patching stuff through the data loose without going into the device is that the actual logical diagram uh, becomes very simple uh, because most of the switches that are in fiber, they connect directly to our core switch. So there's no instance of uh, something on fiber that is behind something else on fiber. And that makes the network relatively easy to manage. Um, obviously, the copper uh, connected switches are behind a, a fiber switch. Um, but that we can deal with. Um, most of the hardware you see here is what we usually work with on other events as well. Uh, we had some new hardware from Arista this time around, so we got to uh, find out how that behaves in the field. Um, I think it turned out pretty well, but yeah, it's okay. Um, so this is what uh, the head of the logical diagram looks when you have it in the data center. The actual network part is on top of the table, uh, which you can see there's the wireless controller and uh, the core switch. Um, and by the way, the core switch is 10G and the uplink on the fibers is mostly 10G, so the data loose have 10 gigabit Ethernet, which I don't think were needed anywhere, but in theory, you could have filled that. Yeah, um, also the middle of that core switch is six times 100 gigabit Ethernet, which um, well, if, if anyone brings a device, I guess we can find some way to plug that in, but um, we didn't need that. Um, so below the table is uh, the servers. Uh, to le the left is actually the VOC encoding streaming stuff. Uh, the right side is our own servers, uh, DHCP, wireless ma management stuff, um, th things like that. Um, and I think this is actually the first outdoor event that we had UPSs in the data center, which we didn't end up needing. Um, however, that was pretty nice to have anyway, since the UPSs gave us a power reading. Um, so this is two kilowatts of power in total, which you have to move out of the container somehow because it all ends up in thermal energy. So you can already see there's two air conditioning units in this picture. Um, there's actually a third one um, behind the camera, so you can't see that. 
And um, there's a fourth one um, at the bottom, which was in the info tent as well, uh, called backup, I guess. And um, I need to point out here that we started with only one of them and it built up a lot of ice on its back and then it went into defrosting mode and then it suddenly turned up the heat to 35 degrees Celsius, which... Really? 44, I'm told. So the servers didn't quite like that. Um, so at some point we went like, hey, why is the server off? Um, so luckily we uh, noticed that pretty early. So we ordered the additional uh, air conditioning units and um, that turned out to work pretty well. So this is down from 20 degrees Celsius. Oh, the unit is wrong. 20 to 15, at which point it's actually pretty annoying to work in the data center. Um, but it, it, yeah, it, it works out. Um, obviously, that doesn't help you to get any internet because you're not next to the data center. So we have the data loose around. Um, and first of all, I would, I would like to thank to all of the volunteers who went around with a key and uh, plugged in people and plugged in power and are hopefully going to unplug people as well. Um, so you can see inside of the data loose, there is uh, one of the Arista switches, some power supply for the access point that is actually mounted outside on the pole. Um, you can also see there's this, let's call it interesting light, which fulfills the purpose, which is to monitor that the data is actually working, since if it stops working, the light will either freeze or turn off. So if the light is working, then you know, well, um, the problem might not be the network. I should better check my laptop. Um, you can also see the fiber spools on the bottom of the picture. Um, we try to only have one of them in each data loop. Um, that works out usually because we just put them away from the core. Um, and um, yeah, we use by the optics, by the way. So it's only one fiber used in both directions. That makes things just easier to manage and patch. So yeah, it's a total of 3.3 kilometers. This is only the fiber. Um, so this was shipped in. Um, it's uh, inventory that we have. And there's two kilometers of copper. And I should point out, this is only between uh, the fiber data loose and the copper data loose, basically, and for some tents. So this doesn't include anything that people bring themselves or people patch themselves or stuff like that. So uh, we come up to, uh, well, just above five kilometers of patching. And that's quite a bit of work to do in the heat. Uh, something new that we did this time around was to run a VoIP network. Uh, which mostly we did because the POC, which usually does, does this, uh, isn't here, and we needed a well, little bit more communication. We didn't have enough radios. And um, this is actually Arian's setup, um, who also ran the Wi-Fi, so I'm going to patch over to Arian at this point, I guess. Ah, okay. So, so Wi-Fi on EMS, EMF 2016. Um, some statistics, uh, we had uh, 66 access points deployed this time. Um, it's a whole mixture of uh, Aruba access points. They are either dual radio 8211N or 8211AC. Uh, most of them are indoor and some of them are outdoor rated. So the uh, AP247, 277. Uh, and we had a lot of the uh, AP135 in the plastic boxes uh, on top of the dot and close. Uh, we had a peak of uh, 2,084 clients. 50% um, of those uh, were on 5 gigahertz, and that's including the badges, uh, which were 2.4 only. Uh, 350 megabits of uh, traffic we seen at uh, a peak, and uh, a total of 4,200 unique devices we've seen on the Wi-Fi network. And it's actually only 300 unique devices we've seen on a wired network. So almost everybody was on Wi-Fi. And I think it's, it's, it's quite a bit lower wired uses than if we compare that to, um, to the CC camp and the Dutch uh, hacker camps. So um, yeah, 1,400 badges we've seen on the Wi-Fi network. And um, that totaled up to 65% was uh, of the clients were using 82NX, so they were using WPA2 enterprise encrypted, properly encrypted Wi-Fi network, and that's without the badges <laughs> uh, because they were on the insecure network. Um, so this fixed five percent eighty two one X includes the uh, the EMF camp or EMF camp uh, legacy network, which was eighty two one X. We ran with our our radio server, and then we also had uh, SpaceNet, uh, which is 
a uh, federated authentication platform for uh, hackerspaces. Uh, and we had Adorome, which is also a federated authentication platform, but for uh, educational um, or research uh, institutions. Um, yeah, so in total we saw about uh, 300 clients, uh, 300 unique devices on, on, on Adorome, and um, yeah, most of the uh, people were actually on the EMF camp network, which is uh, 802.1x and 5 gigahertz uh, only. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, this whole internet of things, of stuff. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so the batch was uh, 2.4 gigahertz only, unfortunately. Um, we've also noticed that the batch wasn't uh, doing any channel 13, so we're actually running a, a four channel setup on 2.4 gigahertz uh, on the Wi-Fi network. So we're using channel one, five, and nine, uh, nine and 13. Um, but the badges uh, were running on a, uh, I think, a US fixed country code when they were handed out. So they couldn't see channel 13. So they had like 25% less coverage around the field. Um, so Equinox actually wrote a patch for that. And I think it's upstream on GitHub or something. I don't know. <laughs> and at first, uh, 82NX was also not working for the badges. And we, uh, we were running out of time to get that fixed. And uh, we also. Um, we, we fixed it afterwards, so they are also able to do A to 1X, so they can actually get off the insecure network. Um, so some obligatory device and username statistics, as we do in other presentations as well. Um, so mostly smart devices on the Wi-Fi network, uh, so your smartphones and your tablets and that kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of embedded devices, so that includes all of the badges, so that's uh, and if we were looking at the uh, operating system families, um, that is on number one, of course, the batch with 1,400 devices. Oh, well, or, or at least the Texas Instruments, uh, as we uh, classified that with DHCP fingerprinting. Um, then we have Android, a lot of Apple devices, and apparently more Windows than Linux, which is sad. <laughs> By one, yeah, well, it's uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> And actually, for the 82NX network, you could choose your own uh, username password, uh, but uh, almost nobody did that because I think everybody read the booklet and it said EMF, EMF, so that's on number one. And we're, there's also some realms uh, in the on the right table for uh, mostly uh, Adderom uh, uh, users. So a lot of, of yeah, nothing hack is actually from SpaceNet, and the rest of the realms is uh, from uh, from Adderom. So um, we like to collect a lot of statistics. So we also are collecting statistics about uh, where, in which rooms or which areas are a lot of people. So we also look at uh, how many people are in which states, and we can correlate that data with uh, which kind of talks there are. So this is uh, this uh, on, on above. You see all of the uh, interesting talks we would had a lot of visitors. So we had the opening talk, and then. Uh, on the first day, and then sex, sex, robots, and <laughs> and after that, people were going to sleep, and ap apparently, a lot of uh, people are sleeping in the f in field G. So we can see that at night, and then the, the next day, we're seeing uh, the talks f uh, of the Simpsons and uh, how I used to rob banks that were extremely popular. And today, we've seen a very popular talk in stage B on hobby electronics like a pro. Um, we've also been fiddling around with a uh, project of ours, which is uh, a, a Wi-Fi probe project, where we have an OPO, open, open WRT device, which will uh, look for nearby access points and try to associate with the access point, uh, try to get an IP address, uh, send some traffic, um, that kind of stuff. And uh, it will report back to our uh, Graphite uh, server uh, about what kind of results it got while doing those kind of tests so we can uh, try and uh, monitor the network from a different perspective. So this is also on GitHub, and if you feeling like helping out with this project, then be very welcome. Um, lastly, some some pictures of our Wi-Fi deployment. So on the left, we, have, we um, 
I think uh, Leon and I were a bit bored yesterday, so uh, we and we saw a lot of people sitting around the big tree uh, near the bar slash knock, and uh, so we thought we had to put up an access point uh, in the tree. <laughs> um, uh, at the back of the field, um, there were almost no Daven clothes anymore, but there were still people camping there. Uh, so we had to do something to get a little bit of coverage there. So we, act we, we mounted an uh, access point to the fence, which is actually uh, has a directional antenna, so uh, it should be able to get pretty far in terms of signal. Uh, on the right, you will see the, um, the whole, uh, all of the wooden poles with the plastic boxes with the Aruba one AP135 in there, ready to be deployed to the Daven clothes. Anyway, that's it for Wi-Fi. I'll go hand it over to um, Equinox again, I guess, or I David, know. or yeah, okay. Let's see how much time we've got first. <laughs> yeah. oh, I didn't. We didn't start the timer, so I don't know how much time we have. <laughs> um, uh, so it should be almost over yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be very quick on this part. Um, for the first time ever, Thursday evening, um, the network was set up. Uh, we were scratching our heads thinking, what have we forgotten? Um, usually we're running around still during the opening ceremony putting switches out, but uh, this time, as soon as all the power was completed Friday morning, the network looked like this, and it stayed pretty much like that the whole weekend. Uh, so some NOC members took on additional projects like monitoring the background radiation in the data center convincing people to use more bandwidth, <laughs> or monitoring the stock of Mate in the bar. We've had three copyright complaints so far, although we're not, con we're not convinced that it's not just an elaborate troll because they're for some quite bad movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, time to, to do some quick thanks. Um, so, many thanks. <laughs> so, uh, I'm building a network the size of a medium-sized ISP for the course of three days and then tearing it down again. It's, it's not a cheap thing to do. Um, and less than, well, around 1% of your ticket price actually goes to the knock, and most of that is for sundries like cables and tools and cable ties that we're always running out of. Um, so building this network at all is only pa possible thanks to our amazingly generous and helpful, helpful sponsors. Um, and I'd like to thank all of them uh, in no particular order, but I will go alphabetically. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so many thanks to uh, Aruba, Booking.com, the Chaos Computer Club, Comtech Enterprises, Eventinfra.org, Fiber Options, Flex Optics, LONAP, and Sargasso Networks. So many thanks. Can I have a round of applause for the sponsors? So um, as I'm sure you all know by now, this event only works if people volunteer their time. And for those who have, we thank you very much. Um, some of us have been here for a week now. Um, we've got another three or four days here on site. If you have time to stick around for the teardown, it would be very much appreciated. If you don't want to work on the network stuff, I know all the other teams need help as well. If you do want to work on tearing down the network, um, it's not quite as simple as just unplugging all the, all the things, so uh, please come along tomorrow morning at 9.30 uh, outside the knock for a quick meeting. And I'll, Tonight. That's... Oh, 9.30 <laughs> hours. Oh, 9.30 hours. Tomorrow morning, 9.30. And uh, i hand over to Peter. Yeah. Uh, hello. So we are uh, a team from the German Cars Computer Club who tries to cover events with, with video recording and streaming. So as but not much people watch streams here, so we don't have fancy graphs to show. So I'll show you a little bit what we did instead. So this is a signal pass, how the video comes from the cameras to the uh, CDN and to the recording. So we you may, many of you have volunteered here and have seen the video mixer and the the, uh, operated the cameras, so the, the cameras, uh, of course, are the source of the picture, and also we have a frame grabber that gets the slides. So you will see in the recording that sadly, if if the, if the video is played from the notebook, there will be some delay. You will see it in the recording, but it doesn't matter. So and uh, everything below the, the top row is done with open source software, and uh, most of them, so <coughs> some of them also written by us. So you you're all uh, welcome to copy that. 
Um, basically, it's uh, a bunch of uh, FFmpeg scripts and uh, a video mixer that's called Voctomix. And uh, on the CDN side, we are running Nginx servers with uh, Nginx RTMP that uh, provide uh, HLS streams for the Apple users. And the rest of the planet gets um, WebM via an Icecast server. And also, besides that, there is uh, Opus and MP3 audio streams. Um, after after you record a talk, or you record many talks, like here, you have the problem that you have many hard disks full of talks, and that's usually uh, not really nice to handle. So we have a post-processing system for that, that uh, keeps track of all the talks and also handles the recording, uh, the en encoding afterwards. Um, this is also soon to be open source, so uh, if you're running a conference or a hackerspace which does regularly events, please get in contact. Uh, we, we love that people play around with it. Um, so at the end, everything ends up on, on media.cccd, which is our, our own video platform, and also in the YouTube channel of the EMF camp. So whatever you prefer, you uh, can see it there. I think there's only one talk who's explicitly opted out from YouTube, but it's not from our platform. So you may be better there. Um, yeah, and there's also a tweet bot you can follow that has now tweeted, I think, 500 times this event uh, about another recording. So yeah, it was about uh, 52 hours of talks that end up in 2.5 terabytes of data, which uh, are encoded to about 40 gigabytes of releases. So each each uh, release is available at H.264 and WebM in SD and Full HD, and also in audio releases in MP3 and Opus. Um, as I said, you can and watch them on our video platform and on the EMF YouTube channel. And if you if you are a user of the Kodi Media Center, you can also just install the CC plugin and then have it on your on your nice uh, TV screen. Uh, the, the both machines you see on the slides, the, the one on top, are the machines that are in the tents that getting the feeds from the cameras and do the the uh, streaming encoding and record to the hard disk the uh, an MPEG TS stream, and uh, the smaller ones and uh, below are the ones that are also shown in the picture from the NOC from the data center. <laughs> These are really tiny boxes where a strange company fits in desktop i7 CPUs with four cores, which makes them basically a plasma uh, cutter on their uh, output. But if you put them in the data center, it's okay. And these two boxes are handled nearly all of the encodings you, you will see. So it's, they, they did really much work because we couldn't travel with our big server case. Um, yeah, we are now nearly done with, I think, four talks are left to cut. Everything else is cutted, and uh, all recordings will be online tomorrow morning when the encodings are done. Um, ah, here is a screenshot of Media CCCD, which is already filled with many talks. So if you want to download something for the way home, uh, do it as long as the camp is still online, and maybe we get another peek in the banter's graph. Um, yeah, thanks for all of you who have uh, volunteered to do uh, video shifts because we couldn't do it without you. Also, big thanks to the EMF crew that uh, made this event possible. And if you want to do something with video streaming or recording, you can find us at the ERC at irc.hackend.eu in Vogue Lounge, or follow us on Twitter, or look at cdrivoc.de, or everything we do is documented in our wiki. So if you are interested more in details, look at the wiki. And yeah, thanks for being part of EMF. I think uh, we've got a small amount of time for some questions. There's usually some people who want to ask something, so uh, feel free to do so. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if it's possible to uh, download the raw data that all the that went in all the graphs. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. We we need to make sure we sanitize anything that's um, sensitive data. Um, 
haven't really thought about that actually. Uh, there's obviously that you can look at the dashboard and get some data out of that. Yeah, for example, okay. for the power stuff uh, to get um, what is the peak power and get... Mm. Uh, to, to be honest, the most useful stuff about the power is actually the design and experience from involved in from doing it. Um, yeah, we get the figures and stuff like that and we can really... It's really nice to verify that we've approximately done it right. But um, yeah, a lot of this is kind of experience like, oh my God, the food vendors use a lot of power. And that kind of experience or... I mean, fortunately, for instance, with the power, we were really lucky that it didn't rain because as soon as it rains, all the really nasty extension leads that everyone's left in a puddle outside their tent, and we have the RCDs tripping everywhere, which is actually what we had a lot of in 2014, and we've been pretty lucky here. I think we've seen on the main sub-mains, like maximum 18 milliamps of earth leakage, which is perfectly fine. No one's dying there. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. What 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 are your main learnings for next time from from the camp here? It's all gone very smoothly. But what would you make better? Thanks for saying it's gone really smoothly. Um, I've been running around. <laughs> There's been a certain amount of running around like a blue ass fly. Um, we um, we need we actually use a lot of 13 amp sockets, and actually getting that number is actually hard because there's not many events like us that provide power to so many people. So um, getting all of these from one one supplier is a little bit tricky. Uh, from the network point of view, um, fiber is great. Fiber is good, yeah. I mean, really, 2014, we spent really a lot of time on complicated solutions and stuff with microwave. Yeah, sure, it works and it is a way to do it, but um, it's really nice to have fiber. Any Anything yeah. interesting from the VOC? Oh, no. <laughs> good. They're consummate professionals. <laughs> so, just have a question. Um, Firstly, how long will the videos be available for on CCC? Um, I'm just wondering. Forever. The rest of eternity. Fantastic. <laughs> um, and second, I was wondering something I can't remember. So, yeah, good. <laughs> was, was there a question at the front? I can't see anything from up here, so it's. <laughs> Something's there. Hi. Uh, you've got a lot of different kinds of network devices in your network. Um, how are you managing them? Are you just going in on the console, or have you got some kind of tools for actually automating it to some extent? HP OpenView, not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we started building scripts in 2012 and have been improving them year on year to automate all the things. Um, we have a Google Docs spreadsheet as our ultimate source of truth, and everything is built from that. You, you may have a different preference. We find it con convenient to be able to collaboratively edit it at the same time. Um, it has everything from our switches, their locations, our access points, our addressing scheme, our VLANs. Uh, so all the data is consistent. And then we have a bunch of Python scripts, which you'll find uh, in that GitHub um, account that uh, just generate everything. How, how much did the um, network influence the choice of location, or were you given the location and then told, what are you going to do here? There is a bit of influence on that. I mean, obviously, being in the home counties, we have a lot more options. Um, we have looked at some fabulous sites that are in, you know, uh, really nice areas of the UK where you look at it and you say, well, my options for internet here are so limited. Um, sure, you can throw money at the problem, but we don't actually like to throw money at the problem. We like to have a friendly supplier that's local, and you know every EMF until now, and, and also the other similar camps have relied on, you know, the the generosity of supporters. Yeah, sure. I mean, I can go and like spend serious amounts of cash on a, an expensive circuit here, but it doesn't actually. It's not actually a, appropriate for this sort of event. So yeah, there is some influence there, and and it is it is uh, there's a lot lot of the, it is one of the factors as well as alongside all the more complicated things like you know what's the road layout like what's the all of these sort of physical layout issues that are quite complicated it is a factor but not a huge one question for the voc guys those i7 plasma cutters what were they are they uh, the gigabyte bricks and they set it as a gaming pc which i don't know who will game on it but <laughs> thank you Hey, 
Hey, so um, what happens to the fiber and the copper left after the event? Do you intend to repurpose it? And how, how much do you think you'll be able to repurpose? So actually the fiber is, um, some of this is, has kind of been going around multiple events. Uh, we, we realized with, um, I think, CCC Camp and Ohm and so on that we actually can pre-terminate all this stuff in advance and, and have a, have the ends of the fiber in, a, in boxes and on nice drums and document it all. So actually what we did was like select a series of fibers from the CCC storage uh, where they live a lot of the time. And uh, we did, it's actually happened before 2014 EMF. And uh, we just like, oh, we need one of these, one of these, one of these, and then put them on a pallet, ship them in this case from Berlin to here um, and roll them out onto the field. So actually we roll this back up and we use it for the next event wherever that may be or whatever it may be is kind of a variety of events so it means that that effort is not wasted but we've, we've you know actual field deployable fiber is kind of expensive so um that works pretty well the copper yeah dave is a copper actually. um if you would like some copper um, <laughs> it, um if you see a copper cable that has boots on it don't take it because it's one of Arians that he's brought to power the access points but if you see anything that we've strung between a dart and clay that's just been crimped for the event feel free to have it otherwise it just ends we finish using it well, well yes <laughs> once, once it has already been removed from the dart and clay um, otherwise we have a local scrap merchant picking it up on Wednesday um, I'm, told, how do you ex I'm sorry I'm told we're out of time because the next talk wants to start <laughs> Okay, are you uh, able to take questions afterwards? If yes, anyone's uh, got any grab, grab us just out the back okay, and uh, cool. we'll answer anything so else. So thank you very much to the NOT team.